Want more Gators Breakdown? Join Gators Breakdown Plus. Starting at $3 a month, get access to unique episodes, plus a blog, chat room, giveaways, shout-outs, and more. Gators Breakdown Plus is furthering the interaction with fans and listeners like you. Head to gatorsbreakdown.supportingcast.fm to join Gators Breakdown Plus today. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter, at GatorDave underscore SEC. Summertime, we're in July. We usually get to it a little bit before this, but heck, we had to read reaction preview not long ago, but now... It's time, as of course, co-host Will Miles joined me to look at these rest of these college football preview magazines, Athlon Lindy's out there. Uh, like we do every year, we'll get into what these preview magazines think about the Gators, the opposing, the opposing coaches' uh, thoughts of what they think about uh, Billy Napier taking over for Dan Mullen. A lot of good info right there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to do it one more time, Will. If you want a more Gator-focused one, there we go. Will Miles, Nick Knudsen. This is all college football in general in this episode with the Athlon and Lindy's, but if you want a pure Gator football preview, readreaction.com slash mag with Will and Nick right there. Great job. Uh, if you guys haven't picked it up yet, do so. It's kind of preview magazine season uh, right now in the summertime as we count down with SEC Media Days coming up in a couple weeks and then football right around the corner. I know recruiting has been the hot topic lately, but let's talk a, bit, a little bit of pure football, Will. Yeah, it's nice to start focusing on football. That was one of the fun parts of the magazine is there's stuff, a little bit of stuff in there about recruiting. But for the most part, it's football oriented. It's roster oriented. It's, you know, who do we expect to make all SEC and who do we expect to win Heismans and things like that. So, you know, look, the, these three magazines are awesome, man. I mean, these are the things we've been going over for years now, uh, back and forth. It's always fun. You sort of know when they're on the newsstands. You know when you start heading out for that summer vacation and you've got that Lindy's magazine sitting in your hand that it's almost time for football. And, you know, I just bought plane tickets to come down for Utah today. My seven-year-old is right. going to go to his first game in the Swamp this year uh, for the Utah game. So we bought the plane tickets today. So starting to salivate a little bit. He, he keeps asking me, what is tomorrow September? And I keep telling him, <laughs> no, we're still eight weeks away, buddy. Still eight weeks away. But but it's only eight weeks, right? I mean, you know, it feels like we've been saying the sort of the same themes over and over in this offseason. And now we finally get the get the kickoff pretty soon and this is sort of the start of that and then the, in the sec media days then fall camp and then it's time man really is really is and uh look i, I kind of limit myself only to athlon and lindy's and that's not really to take a shot at you know any of the other ones out there i know a lot of people are big phil Steele fans and and all that just as, as much as i like numbers i kind of find that a little bit repetitive year after year uh, <laughs> with, with, with phil Steele. so i have a preference of athlon and lindy's uh mostly because those are the first two out. So by the time Phil Steele usually comes out, uh, I'm kind of, you know, I'm already ingrained in the other ones. But, uh, yeah, no, nothing nothing personal there. Just uh, my preference uh, right there. Uh, this, the, uh, just, I guess, maybe just easier. The, the, the easier flow with the, with, with the magazine. So uh, as uh, summertime, summertime's relaxing. Well, it is funny. You said, you know, I was on vacation probably about a month ago, and I had to, I had to find the – Lindy Southeastern version in the airport. So that was, uh, as I was passing time to fly back to Jacksonville from Miami, that's where I found it. So in the Miami airport, and there's uh, the Lindy's with Brenton Cox in the front of it. So, <laughs> well, that's because you only have one kid. So when you go on vacation, you actually have time to do stuff. I've got four. So when I go on vacation, there is no reading going on when we're, when we're on the plane or flying back or anything like that. But, uh, you know, it, it's absolutely, I can remember being a kid, you know, and my, my folks, my dad's from Blacksburg. So we go back to go back to Blacksburg and you'd see the Virginia Tech stadium as you went by and we'd go to the bookstore and there'd be all the preseason magazines there and you'd be able to pick them up. You know, even when I was in high school, I'd get to go pick those things up. And that was the, that was the start of football season. And heck back then you picked up the pre, or at least I picked up the preseason magazines for both uh, college football and the NFL. And uh, you know, so this is, this is sort of that time of, you know, it brings back those memories of going to my grandparents' lake and sitting out there on the dock and reading a preseason magazine. Got to be honest, I'd, 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 I'd trade just about anything I'm doing this week for, for that feeling again. So hopefully <laughs> hopefully everybody else out there is going to be able to pick up some preseason magazines and get to do that in the next week or two. 
Absolutely. All right, we'll get into it. But before we do, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Really helps us out here on uh, on Gators Breakdown. Uh, just you know, really trying to hit that ten thousand mark right before the season starts. So less than a thousand to go. Everybody can uh, you know help, help me there. Help get to ten thousand um, subscribers right there on YouTube. And check us out at the home of Gators Breakdown, news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. Uh, a lot of you, too. Also, thanks for signing up for Gators Breakdown Plus. And then uh, also Gators Breakdown Plus Total Access. You know, one of the perks about that is a custom shout-out. One-time shout-out here. So Landon Stone sends his, uh, sends his in. Uh, he goes, uh, you know, just want to – he's a big Gator guru, love to follow recruiting. Uh, give him a follow at Landon Stone 3 on Twitter. Uh, and uh, just welcome aboard, Landon. Thanks for uh, joining Gators Breakdown Plus. A lot of fun uh, being had there on that Gators Breakdown Plus Discord, of course. So, uh, well, let's get into it right here. We'll start a little wide, and we'll start with the rankings of Athlon and Lindy's. Uh, no need to go through the top 25 to start with, Will, because the Gators are not in it <laughs> in either one of Athlon or Lindy's top 25. Athlon has the Gators 33rd. Lindy's 31st, so not too far out. And, of course, you guys know you've caught, you followed college football long enough. You start getting it in that 15 to 20, 25, 30 range. There's not a lot of difference uh, in, in the teams there. I'll go through uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll list the, uh, the rankings there. But we'll catch you by surprise a little bit. I know right after the season – Last season, everybody comes out with their way too early rankings, and Florida was in some some of those. Florida's not in some of those. But the two big publications here to kick off preseason magazine coverage, Athlon has the Gators 33rd. Lindy's has the Gators 31st. Bit surprised that neither one of them have the Gators ranked? I mean, maybe a little bit. Florida finished 29th last year in the ASP and FPI, so right sort of on that border. And you think about the teams in the East they're going to have to play this year. Tennessee, I'm guessing, both of these magazines have up there pretty high. Kentucky also have them up pretty high. Obviously, LSU is a team that Florida's going to have to play. you got Utah starting the season. So, you know, you've got four or five teams there in front of you on the schedule already in that FBI or in a top 25. So if you think that Utah, if you think Kentucky, if you think Tennessee and, and you think LSU are going to be pretty good, then you sit there and say, okay, well, Florida already has Georgia and A&M on the schedule. And so, you know, Hey, this could be a six and six year. And that's what Vegas has right now. I think, I think the over under for Florida is like six and a half. Um, you know, in a six and six game isn't or a six and six season isn't going to get you into the top 25, a seven and five might sneak you in there. And I think that's kind of what, what these magazines are portending is that the expectation is six and six, seven and five, somewhere in that range for Billy Napier in his first year. Yep. Well, so I will go through, we'll start with Athlon first, Will, and we'll sit here and I'll go through the rankings and you'll kind of keep up with, yeah, Florida's got a lot of ranked opponents according to these uh, uh, preseason polls right here. I am a bit surprised Florida's not ranked in one of them, but Will, you do bring up a good point as we go through the top 25 here you're going to see Florida's schedule is really difficult, really difficult throughout the 25 and really difficult throughout the top 10 uh, as well. So um, you can definitely see why if you – I mean, I, for me, now what these and, – and I've asked Braden Gall this at Athlon. You know, this is how they project the end of the year. Now, this, if this is a pure preseason poll where you're taking out schedule, you're taking out who the teams are playing – I think Florida probably should be in that 25 range, but I can see if they believe with Florida playing Texas A&M and Georgia and Kentucky and Tennessee, all right, well, that's going to play into it. They may not finish in the top 25. And that's how a lot of these top 25 polls are. It's where they project these teams to be at the end of the year. So probably should clarify that a little bit. But if it was a pure preseason poll, which the official polls that come out, well, I say official, but nobody really uses them, I guess. But the polls that we all know, the coaches poll, the AP poll before the season, when those come out, those are you know, pure preseason rankings. Florida might be uh, in, in, in those, Will. But let's start here with uh, Athlon. Penn State at 25, Houston at 24, Pitt at 23, Arkansas, an SEC team, at 22. Florida's first opponent right here in the top 25, according to Athlon, Kentucky at 21, Miami at 20. Wisconsin 19, Tennessee at 18, so it's two so far already. 
of opponents for Florida, Oklahoma State, 17. 16 is Wake Forest, 15, Cincinnati, even with everything they lost there. Michigan State, 14, Oklahoma, 13, with a first-year head coach. NC State at 12, Baylor 11, Oregon at number 10. Another first-year head coach, Will. (laughs) Their Oklahoma, Oregon, first-year head coaches have their team in the top 15. USC, Lincoln Riley, they're at number nine. That's one that shot up purely because of the transfer portal. Another Gator opponent, number eight, Utah. Notre Dame is seven, Michigan six. Texas A&M is a Gator opponent. They're at number five. Clemson, number four. Georgia, three. Ohio State, two. Alabama, one. There's your Athlon. We'll start here uh, going through here on Lindy's as well. 25 is Texas, even though uh, five and seven season last year, they squeezed into the rankings. Here we are again. Kentucky, 24, right here on Lindy's. One Gator opponent right there. 23 is Houston, 22 USC, 21 Cincinnati, 20 Michigan State, 19 BYU, 18 Wake Forest, 17 Ole Miss. Ole Miss not in Athlon's top 25, but in Lindy's top 25. Wisconsin 16, NC State 15, Miami all the way up at 14 in Lindy's. Arkansas at 13, pretty high there, pretty high praise there, Will. Arkansas 13 and Lindy's. Baylor 12, Oregon 11, Oklahoma 10, Oklahoma State number nine. Notre Dame comes in at eight, Utah at seven. Both polls, Gators' first opponent of the season in the top 10. Michigan at number six, Texas A&M five, Clemson four, Georgia three, Ohio State two, Alabama one. So the top is pretty set in its ways, Will, on both sides. But, yeah, going through it right there, you see the number of opponents Florida faces. Some surprise there with some first-year head coaches taking over, have their teams ranked in Oregon and Oklahoma, Ole Miss being ranked, Arkansas being ranked. You would expect. History says, Will, Florida's better than those teams. But as it stands right now, coming off the hills of Dan Mullen, Billy Napier's first year, see some surprises up there in front of Florida. Yeah, I mean, recency bias is definitely a, a, a phenomenon here, right? I mean, hey, we saw somebody play well in a bowl game. We saw somebody yeah. not play well in a bowl game. We're going to project forward from that. Quite honestly, that's all you can do, right? I mean, you, you right. look at what happened last year. You look at who's leaving. You look at who's coming back. You look at the uncertainties and those sorts of things and try to project. And that's really the complication with Florida is I think the – the quarterback position we all expect to be better because we watched the backup quarterback last year and suspect that floor is going to be a lot better. But people who didn't watch that closely look and see six touchdowns and five interceptions for Anthony Richardson, a QB rating that's kind of on par with what Emory Jones is. And I don't know that they necessarily grasp the difference in the way the offense looked different when he took charge. Now, one thing I will say is that Florida, obviously, they've got Utah coming out of the gate. Utah's top 10. you got Kentucky coming up right after that. Kentucky's Mm -hmm. in the top 25. You've got Tennessee in week four. So three of the first four games are going to be against ranked opponents, assuming that those opponents, that those teams take care of business. Now, they should, that, I've, looked, I've looked at those team schedule. Of course, Utah is the first game of the season, so you can't. But Kentucky should be undefeated. Pitt and Tennessee do play again, but Pitt loses a whole lot. So, as you, as you said, Kentucky, you played them in week two. They got a cupcake week one. So, yeah, they'll be ready. Tennessee, week four, their schedules cake up until then. I would probably pick them to beat Pitt this year, but who knows? Who really knows? But going to your point, yeah, I mean, those rankings should really still hold when Florida plays those teams in the first month of the season. Well, and that's where I was going. So Kentucky opens up with Miami of Ohio, then at yeah. Florida, then Youngstown State, and Northern Illinois, right? <laughs> so you think about why they're in the top 25 and Florida isn't. It's because normally you get your four cupcakes, and especially for big-time SEC programs, you've got your four cupcakes or your three cupcakes within Florida State if you're talking about Florida and with Florida State, so your four cupcakes. And the <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and the – the reality is you're four no before you even start the year. And so then getting the seven or eight wins, even in the SEC, even if you go three and five or four and four is, is, is possible in this case, Florida may struggle if things go downhill. Right. But if you play a top 10 opponent at home, even if it's close and maybe you lose that game, do you come out of that with a lot of confidence for when Kentucky comes in the next week? And then like you mentioned, Tennessee ball state, then at Pitt, 
without Kenny Pickett, then Akron, mm-hmm. and then Florida. So Akron and Ball State are not preparing Tennessee for Florida. They may be 3-0 and coming in. They may have an offense that looks great against athletes that are not the same caliber athlete that they have. But Florida's going to have the same caliber athlete they have. So I think it's one of those things where you sort of mentioned that every – every team in sort of that 15 to 30, maybe even 15 to 35 range mm-hmm. is all kind of the same when you're looking at them. Cause they all have question marks. That's why they're in that range. Um, so Kentucky's no different. I mean, I think we all have questions about Will Levis. Everybody seems to think that he's awesome, but I didn't see it last year. I and mean, then, Wandell Robinson pretty much made Will Levis last year and he is gone. <laughs> well, and beyond that, I think there, there is, there is this, this, uh, Ability to overlook the fact that they're losing a bunch of offensive linemen and yes. that Josh Pascal, the heart and soul of that defense, is gone. And you combine that with Anthony Richardson on the other side, and I think Florida's going to have an opportunity to put up 25, 30 points. And when's the last time Kentucky won a game where the opposition put up 25 or 30 points? I, you know, it probably has happened, but I don't remember it. I mean, yeah. usually those games they're winning are 17 14, 17 13. You know, last year they barely able, they were barely able to pull that one out against Florida. It required a blocked field goal return the other way for a touchdown and an interception by uh, Emory Jones deep in deep in Kentucky territory in order for them to be able to pull it out. That's not saying anything bad about Kentucky. They had an awesome season last year, but this here, the, the thing that I think people are missing when they look at this is that Florida was six and seven last year. It was a really bad year, but they were one and four in one score games and their offense was historically bad in the red zone compared to what it has been in, in recent seasons. And so an average season has them at eight and four, eight and five last year, pretty easily. Kentucky, I think is the converse. I mean, you know, that one score game against Florida, if you go look at college football data, I love that site. Cause it tells you like what, like what the probability of a team winning the game would be if it played out that way again, basically without all the stupid mistakes, what would have happened? When Florida won, won that game like 80, 85% of the time. Now, again, names have changed. Things are different. Um, but I think when you think about where the teams have upgraded versus where they've downgraded, I look at Florida and say, hey, I'm pretty excited about that. So, look, I get why people have Florida where they have them. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm pricking them to win 10 or 11 games. But at the same time, I <laughs> I think there are question marks everywhere for all of these teams that they're playing. Until you get to Georgia, even LSU, I think there are a lot of question marks. And so you know, there's an opportunity here for Florida to put up, you know, maybe one loss in the first half of the season and look a whole lot better, even even with some losses, maybe in the LSU, Georgia, Texas a and South Carolina corridor there. All right. So there you go. There's your rankings. All the teams Florida faces in Lindy's and Athlon's top 25. And they have the Gators just outside Athlon 33rd, Lindy's 31st. Uh, Will, so one more thing I wanted to hit in this preseason magazine, and uh, this is on Lindy's side of it. First-year head coach rankings slash ratings here. Um, So this is coaches at their new school. Uh, Not really first-year head coaches, but there are some first-year head coaches in this. Uh, So the only one, Will, they gave a 10. Can you guess that one? I mean. Coaching changes, yeah. So Did they give Kelly a 10? They did not. No, oh, okay. Well, that's good. They didn't give Dan Lanning a 10, did they? I got him in the playoff. So they did not. All right. We can sit here and guess the entire okay. time. I know it wasn't Napier. So no, no. <laughs> Lincoln <laughs> Riley to USC. Ah, oh, yeah. well. Yeah. That, that's, the, he, that's the they, only they thing. Think, they think he'll be excellent at stabbing them in the back three years from now when he goes to the NFL. <laughs> Wait, one more storyline of that is, you know, well, I think a lot of people were saying, well, you're leaving Oklahoma because they're about to join the SEC. Well, now you go to USC and they're joining the Big Ten. So <laughs> well, that just I, means, I, it, that means yeah. he's going to have to recruit players with better academic profiles is what that means. <laughs> and, and I also agree with you that, about the uh, NFL thing uh, too. But, yeah, so anyway, uh, that's the only hire that gave a 10. Uh, Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma to go to USC, taking over for Clay Helton. And, and to well, be fair, that is a significant upgrade from. Clay oh, it is. I, I would, I would give it a ten. I mean, so I have no issue we, whatsoever with that. We one. would be excited if Lincoln Riley had decided to come to Gainesville. Exactly. Though we would also be sitting there waiting for the shiv in the back three years from now when he goes to the NFL. <laughs> so, you know, yep. as long as, as long as you got your ex- expectations set, then you're good. And I would still ask the same question: Can he win? Can he win the big one in the playoff? So it's uh, 
you know, and that's still a question I think we can ask. But uh, yeah, I have no problem uh, on a scale of one to ten them giving that one a ten. But Will, here we go. Mario Cristobal to Miami, a nine. LSU getting Brian Kelly, a nine. Florida, Billy Napier, also a nine. So they're equally all those new hires there. Mario Cristobal, Brian Kelly, Billy Napier, all get a nine rating and a nine grade of going to their new school. Also, Jeff Tefford at Fresno State. We give that a nine. Britt Ven- this one's a little surprising. I mean, I know those names have been, been around for a while, but Britt Venables to Oklahoma, they gave that one a nine as well. Uh, you know, no experience there. That that probably is me. I, I would dock some. Off Zoper, of that. man. Everybody gets a car. Every, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, of, the only other one that's uh, of note for me, Dan Lanning does get an eight. Uh, D.C. at Georgia going to Oregon. Uh, they gave Marcus Freeman, Notre Dame, a 7.5. So, so, I mean, that one to me, I mean, you gave Dan Lanning an 8. And maybe I'm, I, I am splitting hairs. That's the 7.5 for Marcus Freeman at Notre Dame. Dan Lanning gets an 8. But, I mean, Marcus Freeman was still at least at the school as a defensive coordinator, knows the, you know, ins and outs of Notre Dame, knows how to recruit there, obviously. But – yeah, half a point behind Dan Lanning in Oregon. So I, mean, I, don't, I don't get that one. I, I'd give him, if you're giving Lanning an eight, I'd give him an eight as well. Uh, but there we go. Um, Billy Napier, at nine out of ten uh, right there. And they say, after back-to-back, at at times, wacky regimes of Jim McElwain and Dan Mullen, Florida needed normal. Napier is normal. His move after Louisiana had to be the SEC, and Florida is one of the league's premier programs. Quote, the pieces of the puzzle are here. We've got to put the pieces together. Napier said, with Georgia ruling the division and maybe the nation for years to come, the pieces better come together fast. One downside, Napier's lack of experience at the highest level of the game. Like that little summary there, Will? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the. I mean, I guess if you're going to be talking about normal, the first school you got to look at is LSU. But, uh, you know, with some of the clowns they've had out there recently. And, I mean, hey, successful clowns. I mean, Les Miles won a national yeah. championship. And then Orgeron won a national championship. But, uh, you know, that kind of is normal for those guys out there. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got you got McIlwain and the shark and his weird reaction to that. And then you, and the death threats and all that sort of stuff. And you got Mullen dressing up like Darth Vader and, you know, responding to recruiting season like Jim Mora did about making the playoffs. And yeah, it's just, it, it's been an odd decade really at this point in terms of guys who sort of get right up to the precipice of taking the program over the edge and just haven't been able to do that. And so, you know, we talked about this last week with Bill, right? That the results aren't necessarily there on the recruiting trail that we'd like to see thus far at the same time the process that's being put in place is one of normalcy and one that I think is going to give people clear and consistent expectations about how they're supposed to perform and what they're supposed to do. And so I do expect that to translate to a more consistent program on the field. Now, whether it's consistently excellent or not is one of the things I think we're going to be watching and evaluating, but, you know, consistently 10 and three, and then every once in a while having a 13 and 0 or something like that is still really, really good. The question becomes, can you be consistently 10 and three? Cause that hasn't happened in, in three head coaches, right? I mean, you had Will Muschamp come in and have the, had just the awful 2013 after 2012, and then sort of a mediocre 2014. Then you have McElwain come in two straight, pretty good years. And then everything falls apart in his third year. You have Mullen come in two really good years then sort of a disappointing one because the defense in 2020 even though the offense was dynamic and then everything falls apart in his fourth year so I think one of the things we're looking for for Napier is his process in place is going to prevent those highs and lows sort of decrease the sine wave if you will like the amplitude of the of the ups and the (laughs) amplitude of the downs are going to come down now we hope that the whole actual baseline gets raised too and so those highs are playoff highs but uh you know, I, I think in some ways that is sort of the expectation is, is that we're not going to have any of those four and eight seasons, any of those six and seven seasons, any of those seasons where everything just falls apart. Certainly all of those seasons where, you know, it feels like the head coach doesn't want to be the head coach anymore, which is what it's felt like for these last two yeah. head coaches. And so, 
you know, look, I mean, that's kind of a low bar. <laughs> like, hey, we're paying you $7 million. We'd like you to want to be here. Um, but, uh, you know, I think one of the things about Napier is everybody talks about him being even keel. They talk about him being genuine. I think we're going to know where he stands, and that's a positive thing for the program. Yeah, uh, interesting there. You know, uh, it got a grade of nine coming from a group of five school to a power five school. While Mario Cristobal goes from Oregon to Miami, he also gets a nine. Brian Kelly goes from Notre Dame to LSU. He gets a nine as well. So, you know, I, I thought they might dock. You know, I, I don't know how they come up with the rankings or whatever, but maybe dock, you know, the half a point there, maybe coming from group of five to power five, but a lot of belief there uh, in Billy Napier, even though he did it at Louisiana, even though he did it at a group of five school, being able to do it at a power five program like Florida, putting him on the same level as Mario Cristobal going from Oregon to Miami and Brian Kelly from Notre Dame uh, to LSU. So that, that caught my eye there a little bit. You know, I, I thought there might be some, some kind of docking there of, um, as they said, he hasn't done it at the major level yet. Uh, so I guess they're just, you know, saying, well, since he hasn't screwed it up, we can't really dock him for it, Bill. So <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see where uh, we'll see where all that goes. I mean, we, we followed t- 2018 with a magnifying glass wheel because of a lot of the coaching changes. You had Dan Mullen at Florida, Willie Taggart at FSU, Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M. Well, you know, that was a that was a big move just because of us and, and Florida getting Dan Mullen. But this is a this is a coaching carousel that we've never seen before. And Billy Napier is going to be thrown in there with Brian Kelly and, and Mario Cristobal and, and Lincoln Riley, all those first time head coaches as well at Oklahoma and Oregon. I mean, this one, uh, this one's going to be definitely one to watch for years to come and Billy Napier getting thrown in there to that mix. So speaking of coaches, Will, we're getting one of my favorite parts, these favorite parts of the magazine. What do opposing coaches Think about the Florida program, Billy Napier, and all that is the Florida Gators. So let me throw up this graphic as kind of just a little bit summary there, and I'll read the whole thing. So on Athlon, in their preview, opposing coaches size up Florida. Billy Napier was a great hire for these guys, but when you dig in and start looking at his history – it clashes with what we expect Florida to look like and maybe with what their fans demand. Billy and OC Rob Sell didn't win on spread up tempo at Louisiana. Look at the tape. They're going to come in and get big and mean and try to run first. They're creative and modern, but it's built on some really old school stuff. How will that play when everyone wants Steve Spurrier? In terms of pure talent, the roster is probably fourth best in the East and lower than that in the West but they didn't have much to start with at Louisiana either. The really unique unique thing about Napier is that he's always unafraid to do the necessary ugly football stuff that isn't exciting, but this is a higher platform than he's ever been on as a head coach. They're going, they're going to need to – here we go. They're going to need a deep group at running back, and they're going to need a better, different level of play on the offensive line for what they want to do. On defense, it's less about personnel and more about culture change. They've never lacked for talented guys with Todd Grantham. It was just that the scheme ended up hurting them more than the execution. No one thinks they're going to suddenly right the ship and close the gap with Georgia. You should look for a more settled quarterback situation, better turnover ratio, and winning ugly at first. So, Will, a lot to take away from – and look, those are various coaches. That's not just one coach uh, speaking here. Um, so, Will, the first part, of course, is style of play. Uh, it's not the high-flying Steve Spurrier fun and gun. It's not going to be 2020 Florida with Trask and Pitts and Tony. Though, I do think – yes, I, I know what Billy Napier's history says and what it shows at Louisiana. He can get criticized for maybe not – getting a different quarterback and opening it, opening it up a little bit. But he had Levi Lewis, who he knew was going to win a lot of games, stuck with that, won a lot of games with him. So pretty much his head coaching career is pretty much one quarterback. He's had, had a quarterback like Anthony Richardson. So I do expect him to open it up a bit more in year one with what he has at Anthony Richardson. I think we will see some stuff that is a little bit different than what we saw at Louisiana. Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting. I, I think the culture fit aspect of this is really a little bit of, I, I don't want to call it lazy, but it's a little bit of a lazy take when you think about yeah. it from the standpoint of, so answer me this question. When Steve Spurrier took over in 1990, 
<laughs> what ranked higher in points per game allowed, the defense or the offense? What well, ranked higher what now? In points per game allowed in 1990 when Steve Spurrier took over. What ranked higher, the defense or the offense? Which one was better? Which one was better? Yeah. Probably his defense. It was a defense. They yeah, gave him 15 his, I mean, he had a lot of returning guys there. Four of his first five years as head coach, he had a top twenty-five defense in points per game allowed, and then he replaced his deep, then he replaced his defensive coordinator <laughs> with Bob Stoops and wins a national championship. So this idea that Steve Spurrier didn't value defense, or that it was just now, I mean, he valued branding, right? I mean, Spurrier came out and said, "I value the brand and the fact that he was a gunslinger and everybody called him a genius and he used that to his advantage to bring in all sorts of offensive recruits and that his offenses were prolific. I mean, look, it, it's not that his offenses weren't great. In fact, in 1996, when they won the national championship, the offense was the best in the country, but the defense was ranked 14th. So this idea that Florida was like Oklahoma, where they were going up and down the field yeah. and they couldn't stop anybody is a misnomer. That is not what Florida football is. And in fact, under Urban Meyer, if it's, it's even more like that because that 2006 championship team won the championship because of the defense, not because of the offense, not because of the spread that Urban Meyer brought. Now, in 2008, you can make an argument that the offense was was elite, and it was, and you can make an right. argument that that was the reason they won the championship. But look, Florida is known for defensive football. That's why that, everybody got ticked off about Grantham. It was awful. And before you go there, in 2006, you know, like th this makes it sound like Florida fans won't be happy if it's not throwing the ball 40 times. You know how happy I was in 2006? I didn't care what it looked like. Florida was winning ball games. Florida was knocking people off the field left and right. I don't care what it looks like, and I think that is uh, – don't get me wrong. If, if you're losing, you, you'll sit here and point to, oh, okay, well, we're not scoring enough points, you know, just because we're not playing this style of football. I don't care what it looks like. Just go get me some wins. I'll be happy with that. I do know where this comes from a little bit, and it comes from 2020 when Florida wasn't blowing people out on the second half of the schedule after the win against Georgia. Right. Um, because, but, but that's for two reasons. One is that Mullen came in with the promise that he was going to score points just like Urban Meyer did in the, in the heyday and quite honestly had been trending that way up until that Georgia game, and then everything sort of leveled out from there on out. The other aspect of that is that the defense was so bad that you knew – you had to have an offense that didn't make mistakes. And in fact, in the LSU game, the offense made some mistakes, and that's why they lost that game that year, other than the thrown shoe, which is one other reason why they lost the game. But And you think about the Alabama game. I mean, they needed like one stop in that SEC championship game against Alabama and just could not get it. And you knew that, which meant you had to rely on an offense that was prolific. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, if Napier has an offense going up and down the field, I'm not going to complain. But at the end of the day, Florida fans don't care how you get to 13-0. and They just care that you're at 13-0. and <laughs> And that's really the culture, right? If Napier brings a culture of, yeah, we're going to we're gonna smash you in the mouth and we're going to we're gonna be stronger than you, we're going to make you submit in the fourth quarter, and, and he brings that attitude, and all of a sudden Florida is making major bowl games and making the playoff, nobody will say a word. It comes down to is your mechanism or is your philosophy of football going to deliver championships the way Florida fans expect? That's really the question. And so we can talk about style. We can talk about culture, talk about all of that stuff. Now, one thing you can say is that Steve Spurrier – um, revolutionized the way offense was played, not just in not just in the SEC, but in college football. And then Urban Meyer, when he came, the question was, is his offense going to work in the SEC? So the idea that someone's coming in doing something different should not be a foreign thing mm -hmm. for the fans. Is, is Napier's offense different than what Nick Saban's running and what Jimbo Fisher's running and and what uh, Georgia's running up there? Eh, I don't want to emulate Georgia, but you know, if, if you're mm -hmm. At least not on offense, yeah. <laughs> but but if you're, but you know, is it different than what those programs are running? Absolutely. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't think we know yet. And I think one of the things it's interesting. I broke down a play in our preview magazine that sort of showed that Napier, at least from his offensive philosophy, was a shadow of what Patrick Tony does on defense. And I think that's a really cool thing because what that means is, is he's he's figuring out how to get numbers advantages in a way that's going to put the offensive player in a position to succeed. Now he needs a quarterback who's going to be able to execute that. And the good news about the spring game is, and last year's films, it looks like Anthony Richardson is a good guy to be able to do that. It looks like Jack Miller still has a ways to go. So that's sort of, to me, the question this season is, can you keep Richardson healthy? And so when we sit here and go, well, is he going to run the quarterback like Dan Mont? I hope not. Yeah. I don't want Anthony Richardson to get hurt. No hamstring like pulls, yeah. no hits. Like just yeah. drop back at the pocket and chuck it all over the place. And yeah, you know, throw it to your there. tight ends. I'm fine with it. Yeah.
Yeah, I think it'll be there, but I, I agree. I don't think it's going to be, I mean, more than what? I mean, I don't want to see seven, eight carries. I mean, scrambles, okay, you know, you, you do what you do there, but design runs, but I mean, I don't, I don't want more than five, <laughs> honestly. I mean, you, you need enough to be able to keep the, keep them honest to, to keep the opposing defense honest that it's a threat and then at that point if you get one that you have the opportunity to break then great but then it comes down to you know are you gonna slide when there's an opportunity you're gonna put your head down last year you're only getting four or five carries a game you're only getting one or two series you put your head down you bowl over the guy and you try to prove you should win the win the job but uh you know look all i'll say is that the the 2012 Florida win over Florida State, the 37 to 26 mm-hmm. win, where Gillisley puts it away at the end. EJ Manuel gets drilled by Antonio Morrison and, and drops the football. Like that game might be one of my favorite all time games yeah. from a from a Florida Gator perspective. 47 rushes for 249 yards, 25 <laughs> passes for 150 yards. Yep. Driscoll, 15 to 23 for 147 yards and a touchdown. Trey Burton, one of two for three <laughs> for three yards. Yet Gillisley, 24 attempts, 140 yards and two touchdowns. Matt Jones, eight for 81 and a touchdown. And Burton had one for 24. So you, you look at that. That's one of the most enjoyable games I've ever had. And if nothing else, it was because it meant you could leave that game. Brown bragging to Florida State that you didn't just beat them. You kicked their butt. And there's zero excuse for that. So if he goes into Georgia and we win nine to six, but it's clear that Florida is just as physical as the Bulldogs, I don't care whether his yeah. offense is humming up and down the field, but that's yeah. really what it boils down to is the culture of Florida is championships. And so figure out a way to get me there, and I don't care how many points you score, and I don't think most Gator fans do either. Yep. Uh, well, one of the other points in this, what this coach said. Now, I'm, I'm going to agree with what this, what this coach said here. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and say I know more than coaches or anything like that. But we know this Florida roster, and maybe misspoke, but this is what the quote says: "In terms of pure talent, the roster is probably fourth best in the East." No, sorry, pure talent. It's second to East behind Georgia. If you want to sit here and say developed talent, then okay. With where Florida's been, especially on defense and what you know Tennessee and Kentucky may bring. Okay, and if you want to sit here and say develop talent, then you probably got more of an argument to say Florida's fourth best, fourth best in the East. But if you want to sit here and say pure talent, I, I, I can't go that far with you. I'm going to, I'm going to sit here and say Florida. I mean, it will 24/7 Sports will put out their team talent composite. Florida will probably be in that tenth, right outside of tenth range. They were seventh last year. Probably take a bit of a drop a little bit, I would, I would think. But I can't sit here and say pure talent. Kentucky's got more than Florida. Tennessee's got more than Florida, Will. I, I just, you, you won't hear me say that one. No, I think that's ridiculous. And I, and I think, you know, the other thing is is that, uh, you know, Rodriguez, the starting running back for, for Kentucky, got into a little bit of trouble this offseason. Right. Is he going to be available week two? Yep. Um, you know, we still don't know. Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, we'll see. This is always the danger with having a team like Utah there in game one. Like, who's going to be out for, you know, conduct detrimental <laughs> or out with a boot on the sideline when look, there, there's that's another thing. We don't know how Billy, debauchery. So, right. And we don't know how Billy Napier handles that type of stuff. Yeah. So, look, I, I mean, I understand what people are saying. And yes, I think we all would prefer 40 points a game. Um, I actually think Napier is going to come pretty close to delivering what Dan Mullen did on offense, at least with Anthony Richardson as his quarterback. Um, but the the question then is going to be, and again, we've been out in the defensive wasteland for so long. Like if he gave us a top 10 defense with Patrick Tony, one, I'd be so worried that Tony was going to get a head job someplace else after a year. <laughs> and two, I mean, I, I'll I, like at that point, you're almost building a statue to the guy because it's been such a just deba- debacle on the other side of the ball. And, you know, guys running free. You got the 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 real tall guy from AM who tore his ACL and was torching Marco oh, yeah. the whole game there at, at, at College Station. You know, just to be able, and, and this is the thing is Florida's gotten just blown out of some of these games over, you know, in the bad seasons for these coaches. Florida's just gotten absolutely run off the field. And the reason they've done that is because the, the defense has been so bad, except for Muschamp, where the offense just was yeah. three three runs and a punt. And we'll go to the last part on defense. It's less about personnel and more about culture change. They never lack for talent. 
for talented guys with Todd Grantham. I mean, that's even opposing coaches saying, like, we see the talent Florida has on defense. Whatever Todd Grantham was doing, that was not it. <laughs> Again, the one thing I will say is that Tyron Hopper and Diabate both were linebackers who started last year. And if you're looking at the linebacker position from the outside in, I think you look and go, ooh, they lost a lot. But I think you and I and, and anybody who watched the tape against LSU – understands that there's probably some improvement that those guys needed to make between last season and this season if we were really going to rely on them at linebacker. And so is a guy like Wingo really a downgrade? Is a guy like Dewan Black really a, a downgrade? Is a guy like Ventrell Miller, even though he lacks maybe some physical skills that Diabate and Hopper do, is he really a downgrade? But this is where I think you're splitting hairs a little bit because what you're saying is, is they lost talented guys, and that may be true, but the talented guys were not performing. I mean, you can't give up 50 points to Sanford and say anything other than, that's a system failure and a player failure and everything. Right. And so yep. you start thinking about what that really means. And, and, you know, just from an effort perspective, I think that at some point gets you there and, you know, look, we, we've been critical of recruiting. We just did it last week, right? <laughs> we're, we're critical of recruiting, but we're critical from the standpoint of the recruiting classes are not equivalent to Georgia and Alabama. And that when you're going up against teams like Georgia and Alabama, that means that you have a talent deficit. You have a depth deficit, depth deficit, deficit, Florida's out recruiting Kentucky yeah, so, and Florida's out Tennessee pretty much for a decade. Yeah. So there's no talent excuse for losing to Missouri, right? I mean, at that point, you're getting out coached, your guys are getting played harder or getting outplayed, or the coaching staff hasn't developed the guys they brought in, but those guys should have had a better pedigree. And it's probably a combination or an amalgam of all three of those things. And so, you know, hopefully Napier is able to get that ship ready. Yeah. So that really kind of goes right into Lindy's, their opposing coach's view. And a couple of them there. And look, speaking from the choir here, you know, this is just it. The very first thing they say, I don't think Dan Mullen did a good job recruiting talent at Florida. Well, okay. You know, <laughs> we've, we've been preaching that. Opposing coaches see it as well. He was a great offensive coach there, but ultimately he could not control those kids. The same question goes for Billy Napier. Can he manage those kids? Billy will recruit kids that fit his culture and personally – and personality and stay away from the guys that don't but the best kids in florida often have an edge to them and you've got to be able to handle them nick saban is smart and can handle edgy kids i don't know if billy a former saban assistant is wired that way so <laughs> as an opposing coach and i do want to know you know how close they are to billy napier because that sounds like somebody that may have been around this alabama staff when you bring up nick saban and when you bring up saying i'm not sure billy napier is wired that way very interesting there um one more kind of on the talent part another coach says florida should have as much talent as anyone the starting 22 is good they don't have terrible depth they don't have any depth <laughs> so uh, kind of worrisome there uh and one more they're very limited on the offensive line but i will say this if you're going to be limited on the offensive line you'd rather be in the east than the West minus Georgia. So an Athlon, a coach had mentioned, you know, uh, Florida's run game and offensive line. I um, think better there than what they were a year ago. Uh, we probably will get into that at, at some point. We'll probably have to save that for another episode. Uh, but, of course, both bringing up offensive line because they know what Billy Napier is going to want to do and run the ball. But – I'm not sure, especially going back to the Athlon one. They didn't. Uh, they brought up the offensive line and the running backs. There's uh, a lot more there than I think Florida's getting credit for uh, from opposing coaches. Um, and we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll see that Osiris Torrance getting a lot of high praise um, through these preseason magazines. But will, as far as Lindy's and the coaches they talked to, it was a whole lot about the talent that Dan Mullen did not assemble at Florida. Yeah, again, I think that's a little bit of an excuse, right? I mean, because losing to teams like South Carolina, yeah. you know, Nick in our preseason magazine, he, he sent me this stat when he was writing. He goes, you know, we're 6-6 six and six in the last 12 games against South Carolina. Yeah, that is and one went, team. Oh, like yeah. that just can't, that can't happen, right? It can't. And, and struggles and, versus Missouri as well. I mean, that's just two schools, Florida, more talent than just for whatever reason, has some struggles. Absolutely. So I think I think it's a convenient excuse for um I, I think it's a convenient excuse for 
people who look at it and say, well, you just didn't have enough talent. That's why you lost. And I'll be honest, the losses to Georgia and the losses to Alabama in many ways are because of that. Mm -hmm. But the losses to Missouri and South Carolina and all those guys, I, I just don't buy that. And so I think there is... Uh, but it kind of goes to some of the point where, where we're saying it it limits margin for error. Like the talent is not where Alabama and Georgia are. Those guys don't have to play perfect games versus the likes of those school, and they'll still come out on top. Florida couldn't do that. Sure. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not saying that there's nothing to the fact yeah. that they have less yeah, talent. Yeah. I'm saying that to sit there and look at their roster and go, well, he just didn't bring enough people. That's why they didn't win. I mean, the reason they didn't win is that he didn't play Anthony Richardson last year. That's why they didn't win. So, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, let's call a spade a spade. To me, that's really sort of what what that is. And, it, and if you're going to look at talent, if you're going to really hit the talent hard, offensive line isn't the place that I would hit it as a mm -hmm. criticism. I, I mean, I would hit it at defensive line. I would mm -hmm. hit it at at wide receiver. I might even hit it at linebacker. I, I wouldn't hit it at offensive line. I think, you know, Ethan White was really good last year. And then when he got hurt, the Florida offensive line and the Florida running game sort of fell apart. So if you can keep him healthy with Kingsley, Agokin, Ethan White, Richard Garage on the left side of the line, you got Josh Braun and you mentioned Osiris Torrance. I'm comfortable with the five guys they have on the offensive line. Now you can talk about the depth maybe, and that might be an issue, but right. out of all the places I'm concerned about going into the season, the offensive line is one where I go, yeah, there are some issues and yeah, you know, there's some uncertainties and you know, all those sorts of things, but I don't sit there and like quake in my boots that the offensive line mm -hmm. is going to be a problem. Um, now I do wonder who the hell we're going to throw the ball to. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I wonder if we're going to be able to get any push on opposing quarterbacks. Cause look, you can have the best defensive scheme in the world. But if you're not getting any pressure on the quarterback, it doesn't matter. You're going to get you're going to get carved up, and so I think there are legitimate concerns for the, both of those. So I think it's really interesting that they zero in on the offensive line mm -hmm. when that's the one position, or maybe one of the positions that I'd look at and go, eh, like it's not, it's not terrible. Like I don't look at it and go, you know, like I, I don't look at it and go, they're plugging holes with guys who are below SEC quality. Yeah, but to go and back to the Athlon one, it was. They're going to need a deep group at running back. Okay, that took a hit. Demarcus Bowman goes. Um, and they're going to need a better, different level of play on the offensive line for what they want to do. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I, I'll – again, I think it depends I think they have on... what they want. As long as they stay healthy, I think that starting five, six, I think they have enough of what they want to do. I mean, thankfully, Osiris Torrance is part of that, and he came over. That's a huge part in that, but I, I, I think they have that. And maybe well, it's just kind of wait and see. For that well, coach. I mean, here, here's the thing is that Florida led the nation in running yards on a per attempt basis, not just a yardage attempt basis for almost all of last year. And they averaged 6.3 yards per attempt in the seven games that Ethan White started that dropped almost two yards per attempt when he when he went out of the lineup. So you look at you go through week seven, you go through essentially the 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 LSU game and then maybe the Georgia game. I think that's I think he went out after the Georgia game. And then from then on Florida couldn't run the ball. And lo and behold, the offense struggled when, when they couldn't <laughs> run the ball. So you think about what Napier wants to do, it's gonna he's gonna want to run the ball. Now I guess you can look at that as two ways, right? You can say, well, Ethan White's coming back. He's going to be healthy, so they should be able to run the ball. Or you look at it and go, wow, they didn't have anybody behind Ethan White who could pick up the slack and allow them to run the ball. So I guess you know, if you're looking at it glass half empty, maybe you say, well, pending health on the offensive line, you know, they might be good, but if they have any injuries, it'll be hard to fill. But I do think that Napier has started to bring in some guys who are going to be able to backfill those sorts of things. And let's be honest, everybody other than Alabama and Georgia – if they suffer significant injuries to their offensive line is yeah. going to struggle on the offensive side of the ball. Like Will Levis is not making it through the entire year. If Kentucky loses its left tackle and left guard, especially I mean, that, this year, because they've already they, like, they lost a lot off of last year's starting offensive line and they were expected to take a hit there. Yeah. So again, I mean, look, I, I get where they're coming from. I get mm -hmm. that you look at it and go, there aren't major stars here, except I actually, I mean, I, I have Ethan White winning the, or being an all SEC player this year. I think he's probably going to be able to get there. Um, the question to me is going to be, does he get there because Torrance is going mm -hmm. to have so much preseason hype? Does that prevent White from getting the credit when the offensive line plays really well? But I look at it and say, the Torrance, the Stuart Reese to Osiris Torrance upgrade is significant. The Ethan White healthy upgrade is significant. 
Equican now has really another well. year. Garage yeah. played left tackle pretty well. And now you're just looking at right tackle as a place where, let's be honest, I think Delance played better last year, but he wasn't he wasn't all a world out there. And so you're, you're bringing in a guy where potentially now you've had an opportunity to upgrade at all the spots that were a little bit sketchy last year. And you've got guys like Tarquin who've, who've gotten experience mm-hmm. out there. So you got Braun and Tarquin and then, you know, Cameron Waits coming in big guy, guy Napier trust, somebody who knows his system has been in the system for a couple of years. Is that somebody who's going to be able to get into the lineup? So I'm really curious actually to see in fall camp, whether it ends up being, you know, eight or nine deep, as opposed to the six deep we've had over the last couple of years, I think people are going to be surprised by how much depth is on the floor on the Gators' offensive line. There are going to be other places where we go, "Woo, we can't sustain an injury," or "Woo, I wish we had three more guys at this particular position." But I, I don't think offensive lines going to be one of them. All right, Will. So we're moving through this episode. So like, look, we'll have to break this up into two episodes. But before we, because we'll have to get, I'll get, we'll get into unit rankings where each uh, position group ranks for Florida. And all American, all SEC. We'll push that to the next episode. Um, but before we do here, mention the top 25, but let's go through the order of finish uh, right here from both magazines. Starting right here with Athlon, Georgia taking the East. They have Tennessee number two, Kentucky third, Florida fourth, South Carolina fifth, Missouri sixth, Vanderbilt seventh. No surprise there. Um, man, man uh, is Vanderbilt ever not going to be picked seventh in, in any time in the near future? I, I, I'm no. just, I, I don't see it. Though I will uh, say they're recruiting yeah. on Missouri and South Carolina's level now that, uh, now that, uh, the, the guy Part, from uh, partly there. Yeah. But he, they brought in, um, oh, I can't remember his uh, name. Simmons? Martin, Martin Simmons, Martin, Martin Simmons coming in from, from, uh, rivals are 24 seven. They've really bumped up their recruiting game there. So they I might just, be picked sixth in the next couple of years. He's just using his friends to bump up the rankings there. <laughs> I'm, I'm all good with it. I, you know, I, I, again, I like people who do things that are different. I like yeah. seeing things that – look, I mean, if you're Vanderbilt, what do you have to lose, right? It's not like, hey, I'm Florida. I've got all of this mm-hmm. uh, all this history. Go do something different. Like pretend like, pretend like you know, you're going you're gonna to struggle at some point because you are going to – like you do need to do those sorts of things you're at, at a place like Vanderbilt. But anyway, let's stop talking about Vanderbilt. Yeah, so there we go. Uh, Vanderbilt in the cellar. Sorry, I was trying to go back. Lindy's didn't give their projected record uh, for the order of finish, but I think Athlon – yeah, Athlon did. So um, we're here, yeah, at Athlon. They have Florida going 7-5, 4-4. and, five, four and four. Um, But, Will, I'm gonna, I am going to dive a little bit deeper there before we sign off. Georgia, they have Georgia 12-1, and 8-0. Oh. But here's the thing. Tennessee eight and four, four and four in conference. Kentucky eight and four, four and four in conference. Florida seven and five, four and four in conference. So that actually is pretty much a three way tie for second <laughs> between Tennessee, Kentucky, and Florida. Florida play in Utah. They probably are given the loss there. So that is the difference in the seven and five record that they give eight and four for Tennessee and Kentucky. So well, I mean, like, as we said, when we went through the rankings, there's not much difference in that 15 to 35 range. And when they start, well, wait, at least with Athlon here, four and four for Tennessee, Kentucky, and Florida. Now, I mean, it, look, it's it's interesting because I think Tennessee obviously had a, had a very good offense last year. They ranked seventh in points per game. They ranked 18th in yards per play. You look at um, the – uh, they've got Hinton and Hooker coming back, so you expect them to be able to score, right? But the problem with Tennessee is they also rank 97th in points per game allowed on defense. So now they were 61st in yards per play rank. So if you look at that and say, hey, they might be able to get up into the 60s on defense. Well, okay, then yeah, that's like a middle of the pack team because they have a you know top 50 defense and a top 10 offense. You know, unless you're Oklahoma playing in the Big 12 where there's no where Texas is down and there's nobody else to beat, you know, you're not going to be able to win with that profile in the SEC. You're going to get you're going to get sniped a couple of times if you're in that profile. Now, Florida is sort of the opposite. They were 44th in points per game rank, 39th in yards per play rank on the defensive side of the ball. And then on the offensive side of the ball, 61st in points per game, but 21st in yards per play, which suggests the offense can be better this year. So really what we're talking about is a battle between which team is going to be able to move up in those mm-hmm. rankings more this year, which one's going to be able to really sort of, you know, right the ship, 
you might say. And yeah. if you think about it, Kentucky, and this is why I think picking Kentucky high is, is asinine. Kentucky was 24th in points per game ranked last year in the country, but they were 51st in yards per play rank. So what that yeah. says is there were defensive scores, there were special team scores, there were field position-based field position, scores, yep. and the defense was really sort of holding them in the game. And then, and that that's actually reflected in the numbers. They were 24th in points per game ranked allowed on the defensive side of the ball, 15th in yards per play ranks. So they had an excellent defense that sort of masked some of the things that were going on on the offensive side of the ball. Well, Pascal's gone. The defense is going to take a step back at Kentucky, or at least be more in line with what they've historically been at Kentucky, which means I think it's hard to say at least um, – historically that this is a good choice to put Tennessee and Kentucky in front of Florida. I, I think, you know, look, I'm a homer. I get it, but <laughs> I still look at it and I go, if all of them are essentially going to be eight and four, then, or at least four and four in the conference, which one would you pick? Eh, I'm, I'm going to go with Florida. Cause I think now the one thing I will say is that because Florida has Georgia and then a and M on mm-hmm. the other side, that might be one of the reasons why Florida's sitting there fourth because Tennessee and Kentucky just don't have that. So, you know, you got Georgia, AM, and LSU on Florida's side of the ledger. Tennessee obviously always gets Alabama at the same time. You know, who's Kentucky getting from the other side? So maybe that's a schedule pick more yeah. than anything else. But uh, I, I think things are rife for Kentucky to take a step back. I think everything has to go right on the defensive side of the ball for Tennessee to be anything more than they were last year. Because last year they scored points like crazy and couldn't stop anybody. So really, is Josh Heupel's team going to score like crazy and make them that much better? No, the place they're going to have to get better is on the defensive side of the ball. Who on the defensive side of the ball are we looking at saying is going to make Tennessee better? You talk about the dearth of talent on Florida and the dearth of development for Florida. But what about the Tennessee on the defensive side of the ball? I think that's something that maybe is being overlooked there. And I always go back to the Josh Heupel started out all world at UCF and found out a way somehow to get worse every year. Um, wondering if that happens at, at Tennessee as well. You got that offense in the SEC, maybe caught some people by surprise. Now there's a year of tape on Hooker. There's a year of tape on that offense. Uh, and as we said, if that defense doesn't bounce back, then look, I, it's going to be a good offense. It's still going to be a good offense. I just do wonder, as you said, Will, how big of a rebound can they make on defense and – is that offense as good with a year of tape out there uh, for these defenses? So go to the West, Will, no surprise, Alabama leading the way there. Texas A&M second, Arkansas third there from Athlon, LSU fourth. So interesting coaching changes at Florida and LSU. Both are picked fourth in their division. Ole Miss fifth, Mississippi State sixth, and Auburn seventh, kind of a – you know, not really a surprise, but you never really see Auburn picked in the uh, bottom of the SEC West. You definitely see it in Athlon, and we'll go to Lindy's uh, as well to finish this up. They do have it a little bit different on the East. They have Georgia, and then they have Kentucky second over Tennessee, Florida fourth there as well. The rest of the East is the same, South Carolina, Missouri, Vanderbilt. West is pretty much the same a little bit to start up the top. Alabama, Texas A&M, they have Arkansas third, Ole Miss fourth. LSU fifth, Mississippi State sixth, and Auburn seventh there. there. So we'll pretty much uh, hit everything. Uh, not too much difference between the two. Uh, as we always know, um, these order of finishes, lately they've been able to nail the winners, at least SEC media day-wise. There used to be uh, this streak of being wrong at SEC media days of picking the division winners, but they've been pretty right recently. It's been pretty easy to do so uh, with Georgia and Alabama leading the way in recruiting that kind of revealing itself to play out on the field. Everybody did kind of pick Florida in 2020. They got that one right. So the top of it has been pretty easy uh, to figure out, but you never know what happens after those top teams will. Yeah. I mean, the top two, like you said, are pretty easy. I think, um, the interesting thing is it's going to be October 8th that Alabama plays Texas A&M. And I'm not sure that whatever team loses that game is necessarily going to have a whole lot of motivation from then on, um, mm. which will be kind of interesting, right? I mean, does A&M fall apart if Alabama comes in and smokes them? Or just, is, is it a changing of the guard, right? And A&M comes in and beats Alabama, and all of a sudden people see the, in a row. Yeah, and people see the sort of the – the you know the 
the Achilles heel for Nick Saban. And all of a sudden people start figuring out how to, how to beat him in a way that maybe they haven't in the past. Now, look, I'm not going to predict the end of Saban, but at some point it's going to come. And I know it's going to come from a team that's recruiting like crazy. So Texas a and <laughs> is one of those candidates. Now, obviously the guys that they just brought in this past year, not all of them are going to be contributing by the time October comes around, or at least starters and that sort of stuff. I mean, you think about Percy Harvin, Percy Harvin, um, you know, contributing right away, Tim Tebow contributing, but not necessarily contributing at a starter level when he comes in. But that's sort of the interesting thing for me. And I am not buying the Arkansas hype. I don't know. Like, I I'm think Pitt, I think either. Pittman's done a, done a nice job with Arkansas. I think Felipe Franks came in and sort of righted the ship a couple years ago, gave them consistent play quarterback. I think KJ Jefferson is a step up from Franks, but he's not he's not much beyond, you know, the, the Emory Jones and those sorts of guys. He had some big games last year, but you know, Go back you, you look- his performance versus Georgia and Anthony Richardson's performance versus Georgia. There ain't much difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, and where's the room to grow, right? I mean, I think if you look at Richardson, you say, look, KJ Jefferson is somebody who'd been in the system for a couple of years and somebody who you look at and say, there there's a ceiling but the ceiling is close i think you look at Andy richardson and you go there's a ceiling and it's pretty far away and so there's an opportunity to move there i'm not buying the arkansas hype plus the week before texas a&m goes to alabama they're playing at arkansas which means you know look i mean arkansas that's great but they're gonna have to play alabama they're gonna have to play a&m they're gonna have to play lsu um i i think i think it might be a long a long year for the pigs and look at me a long year could be six and six because you've been predicted to go mm-hmm. you know nine and three ten and two something like that if you're gonna finish in second or third in the west they got um, them uh well, well they got them eight and four they have third fourth and fifth well this is the athlon so arkansas lsu Ole miss all eight and four all four and four yeah it's just i mean look i think i'll have to look at the exact schedule for arkansas but right. it's one of those things where i just they have had some impressive wins over the last couple of years but those impressive wins in many ways have come because they have snuck up on people and they open up this season with Cincinnati to start with. Mm -hmm. Then they get versus Texas A&M and then, and then Alabama. Then they're at Auburn LSU and then geez. So, I mean, they do, they do have Liberty and even BYU. Like you look at their non-conference, I mean, Cincinnati, BYU, Liberty. Who do they play out of the East? So they play South Carolina. Yep. In week two. Oh and, wow! Okay. Uh, and Missouri. So they do get South Carolina, okay. Missouri. But still, I mean, you know, I, they ain't beating A and M and Alabama. And I know Cincinnati has to replace Ritter, the quarterback. But Cincinnati is still a good team. Mm-hmm. Uh, BYU's a big good team. Yeah, BYU is going to be decent. And you know, look at Mississippi State. I know I make fun of the Pirate all the time, but I think Mississippi State can get can against a team that's not elite especially can uh-huh. can jump up and jump up and grab you i think everybody looked at that mississippi state win over lsu a few years ago and thought oh mississippi state here they come <laughs> and then lsu just sort of falls apart over the next two years and i i think in some ways arkansas is kind of like florida in the jim McElwain era that first couple of years where they had very good records but everybody knew they weren't a real good football team that's kind of what i think of when i think of uh when i think of arkansas the last couple of years they've had pretty good records i mean you know, look, all credit to them. I think we all expect them to go 0 and 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in, in 2020, they're, much, right? they're in a much better spot than they used to be. I mean, they, they deserve credit for what they have. I'm, I'm just like you. I'm not ready to jump on that eight, nine win season. I'm not ever going to be ready to jump on the eight or nine win season <laughs> for a I'm just not. There's six. I mean, Felix six Jones and Derek McFadden's not in that, in that backfield. So. Absolutely. Oh yeah, so a lot of good stuff there. Um, looking at order of finish, that's the way. That's where we'll end this one. As I said, I, I packed a lot into this episode. We didn't even get to all SEC uh, unit rankings as well. Um, so a lot to get into there. I'll go back and, I, and I'll save it to a, kind of a Os- Osiris Torrance feature. He joined us on the Gator Collective Spaces last week, right on the heels of him being named uh, Walter Camp All American First Team. So uh, we'll pl- I'll play that uh, next episode. Will and I get together, kind of finish up these preseason magazines. You'll get to hear from Osiris Torrance and what he said uh, last week about that honor. So, uh, Will, uh, anything else, man? I know you, your latest at Read and Reaction, diving into the uh, NIL world just a bit. Yeah, we were looking at uh, – people haven't – there's been a lot of talk about why the NCAA isn't, 
enforcing its rules. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to NIL, and I know there's a Florida state law and some other things as well, but the reality is, is the minute any of these things gets enforced, the Supreme Court's made it pretty clear they're unconstitutional. So there's not really any disincentive to cheat other than, or cheat, quote unquote, other mm-hmm. than you're not, other than you don't want to cheat, right? Like, there's not going to be any penalties. I, I don't think there's any way the NCAA comes and actually penalizes any of these programs who are paying the players to come to a school to play football for for many reasons but the main one is is that you're ignoring the reason that these players have any value in the first place is that they play football and that they play football for your school so to have an nil deal you know selling buick somewhere is only because you decided to go to miami or you decided to go to florida or you decided to go to oklahoma or something like that so take, t- just took a look at that what's the incentive structure what do we sort of expect i had written the bulk of it before ucla and usc decided to go to the big 10 <laughs> And all of a sudden, things started reorganizing, and I always sort of expected that a reorganization would happen. But the more I look at it, the more I think the NIL, uh, the NIL model is going to stay around longer for a bunch of different incentives that I write about. So that's over there. And then I'm actually working right now. Before we came on air, I was working on a write up on Stetson Bennett. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in. Obviously, that's that's the my hometown, my hometown boy. Well, and that's the North Star, right? I mean, that's where Florida <laughs> wants to get to, where we're consistently beating Georgia. Um, you know, Kirby's decided to roll with Stetson for the last couple of years, and he's got him coming back again. And the question is, he put up some really gaudy numbers. Mm-hmm. And the question is, are those gaudy numbers real? And so that's really sort of the the question I'm answer or the question I'm asking. I haven't finished the analysis yet, so I don't know because um, I don't want to. You know, I'm asking the question. I want to legitimately answer it. And, you know, people may be disappointed with me when I go, Ooh, this is real. We're in trouble. Or it may be, Hey, it's a little bit of a mirage. This is how you take advantage of them. I just don't know yet. I haven't looked at I mean, he's, to figure that part out. I think we know it. he's good. I mean, we, we know enough, but he is good. Um, now, could he be doing that at Missouri? Absolutely not. I mean, he's got to have that Georgia offensive line. There's Georgia weapons and all that around him. You know, I don't, and I'm not sure he's, you know, he's not a quarterback that elevates the 10 other guys around him like so a lot of other quarterbacks do. Uh, but, you know, in that system, with that talent around him, he's a good quarterback. Well, that's the question I'm asking, right, yeah. is what is his capability of elevating the people around him? And are there statistical markers and even film markers you can look at? I mean, he's either... very smart. I'll give him – he's very a very smart guy, very smart quarterback. Well, I mean, I think you got to be smart to play college football. Yeah. The question usually isn't a matter of smart. It's a question of how fast can you process mm. information. And so anyway, I've, I've got a bunch of different stats I try to look at to try to evaluate that sort of stuff. Um, at the high school level, all I can get is completion percentage and yards per attempt. So that's usually where it sort of stops. But once you get to college, you can really start breaking down like, you know, <laughs> throws to the right sideline and how often is he inaccurate and those sorts of things and make comparisons to SE, other SEC quarterbacks. So that's one of the things I'm going to be doing in this one is saying, okay, if we take this benchmark of elite play, this is where you need to be. Where does Stetson Bennett compare to those guys? And then, you know, depending upon how that goes and and uh, how people like it, might do the same thing with Anthony Richardson, though obviously Richardson has uh, has less attempts than Bennett does, less tape, less 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 uh, sample size to be able to to analyze. But uh, you know, look, I mean, that's 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 a team, right? Do we have hope to pick off Georgia this year? And I think the answer is going to rely on Stetson Bennett how much he improved from 2020 to 2021 and how much the 2021 SEC runner up season there for Georgia was because Stetson Bennett was able to manage the game versus able to make key plays. And look in the national championship game, he made the key plays we needed to in the SEC championship game. He didn't. And, you know, that that's a big part of why Georgia was where they were and part of a reason why they were where they were. And, you know, <laughs> so that, that'll be the look that I'm taking. And like I said, I'm trying to take an honest look at it, uh, mm-hmm. not just the orange and blue glasses, but take an honest look at Bennett and look at some key markers and try to give people an idea of should you have significant amounts of hope before Florida goes into the cocktail party this year or is it one where we should say, look, we're going to punt that one. We're going to expect it to be an L and let's go focus on the Missouri's and the South Carolinas and the Kentucky's of the world in the, uh, in the first season under Billy Napier. His completion percentage in high school will 64 and 62% this two years. <laughs> I love that. I got you looking that stuff up now. Yeah, that makes me happy. What, what, what is it? I was looking while I got you here is because he is from, you know, my hometown. So if it was, if Matt, Pre- Max preps didn't have it, I could contact the, uh, 
the old alma mater and get you a Stetson Bennett stats probably. Well, I was so. going to say, is, is, is someone of Dave Waters' physical stature the cornerback there at, at the opposing schools, or is, or is it big-time football down there? In, uh, uh, Pierce County has gotten much, much – just won a state title a couple of years ago, so they have gotten much better. Stetson Bennett was part of that, by the way. So, uh, yeah, much better winning uh, – competing and winning state championships now in Pierce County. So. I was going to say, so back when you were playing there, you were, what, a defensive Oof. lineman? What, what was the uh... – <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did play a little linebacker, so and you've seen me. I'm not a big guy, so yeah, that was I, I did uh, early on play a little bit of linebacker. So yeah, they're, they're much better now than. Well, you've just thinned out since your playing days. You were oh, yeah, that's, what, that's in, what it uh, is. That's what it back, is. Back back then when you were a linebacker, you had like the neck <laughs> that re- that necessitated the big uh, the big board up behind it. It was just because I could call the plays out. Well, that's all it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Anything else, Will? Nah, I'm good, man. All right, Will Miles, readreaction.com. You can be sure to check out his preview of the Gators. Readreaction.mag. Wait, readreaction.com slash mag. There we go. Readreaction.com slash mag. I'm your host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.